good good afternoon good evening um yeah. to everyone I, I know that we've got an audience that's actually across the globe so it's lovely that we've got uh people from india pakistan also from people from the uk so my name is robin ray i'm a um consultant at St George's Hospital in London. My background is actually in cardiology, so I'm a cardiologist, but um, I've done a lot of teaching in MRCP and organized many different courses at various levels for MRCP, but I've got a particular interest in PACES, uh, both in communication, but also um, uh, the clinical examination stations as well. But between myself and Gotham, we've got about an hour or so uh, to take you through some of our kind of tips and tricks um, behind um, the communication stations. Um, I mean, I, I say I, I, I've taught um, uh, a few thousand um, candidates now through my courses on um, PACES. And one, one of the issues that we find, particularly with people whose first language isn't necessarily English, and for particularly those um, doctors who haven't gone through the UK system, it's really, really tough. And although clinical skills may be very good and you may be able to pick up heart murmurs, um, chest signs, abdominal signs, the key thing is to be able to convey that in a language that's quite structured in the format of PACES so that the PACES examiners are able to tick you off and give you good marks. And you always have to remember that you're competing against local candidates who do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Every single day they do it and they present and they get scrutinized by consultants. So it's a tough call actually, because you're having to work, and it's particularly if you're not working in the UK, it's really, really tough. So the idea behind um, webinars like this and the courses that we offer is to try and give you that added um, benefit uh, and give you the tips and tricks to try and help you uh, get through, for instance, in this case, PACES, first time. We know that if you do it first time and you pass, you're much more likely to pass first time. And the more times you take it, um, unfortunately, the less, less chance you have to pass. So I've, I've got a few um, slides which I'm going to try and bring up. Um, let me see if I can, hopefully you can all see this. Can everyone see this? Gautam, can you see my slides? Yeah, I can see you, Robin, so I think okay, it should lovely. be visible to everybody. Yeah. Okay. So I think you all know about this already. So this is the, the PACES carousel. Um, I won't go into in too much detail, um, but, but today we're going to really focus on station two. Uh, I don't know if I, this is gonna work, here we are. We're gonna focus on station two, which is the history taking station, and also station four, which is the communication skills and um, ethics station. You're probably aware that Station 5 also does have um, some communication um, as part of it, but this is a little bit different because it's a bit of history, it's a bit of examination to try and come up with uh, what's going on. So, But we're going to focus on Station 2 and 4, uh, which is really where a lot of the marks are, but also where um, candidates from outside the UK don't do very well. So firstly on um, Station 2, now, um, effective clinical communication skills are essential to obtain an accurate history of the underlying the medical, uh, psychological and social concerns, and to be able to address the patient's concerns. And most candidates, like yourselves, are able to focus on the medical aspects very well, but the best candidates also address uh, the psychological components and any social problems uh, such that the patient, uh, the patient may have, and in doing so, they're able to address the patient's concerns. Now, this ability also does matter in real life, not just for patient safety, but also to reduce um, patient complaints. Now, we organize a course um, to ensure that these um, specific learning outcomes parallel what the Royal College of Physicians require um, as part of their examination. And in station two, this is basically what you aim to do and what the marks are for. So you need to gather data from the patient, you need to address their concerns, you need to construct a, a differential diagnosis and then formulate a management plan, which you need to explain to the patient clearly. And all of this, during all of this, you need to respect the patient's dignity um, uh, appropriately. Now, 
similar to station four, um, you get written instructions. It's usually in the case of um, a letter from the patient's GP, and you'll have about five minutes to read through this, and you can have paper and a pen uh, or pencil to note down um, uh, a few things. So you can, so you can you know, write down a structure behind what you're going to do over the next 14 minutes of history taking. You then have um, a one minute period of reflection where you need to kind of summarize your thoughts. Think about, again, the differential diagnosis. Think about your management plan. Think about uh, things that you may have missed and think, think about how the consultation went generally. And there are two examiners present throughout this whole period who are observing your interaction with the patient and the whole thing takes um, 20 minutes. So we, we shall guide you through um, how to approach uh, history taking station and then to structure the consultation to make it easier for you on the day. Now, obviously, this starts with um, the greeting um, and it's important uh, to have appropriate body language, such as eye contact, ensuring there are no barriers within the room, and ensuring that both you and the patient are comfortable. And it may actually mean that you move around the furniture to make it more comfortable for both yourself and the patient. There are some examiners who, for instance, will put the ch your chair behind the desk and the patient will be behind the other side. And they'll expect you to move the chair across so that you're closer to the patient. You don't have that barrier uh, of the table. You need to learn how to focus on how you talk with your patient and engage in active listening. And we shall go through um, tips and tricks on how to go about this. It's really important to understand um, how to build up a rapport with your patients and how body language can affect that consultation and how you're perceived by the patients. You want to come across as someone who is approachable, someone who is um, easy to talk to and understand, someone who is listening and um, also keep, keep what you say confidential. So to start off, we need a, a, a good introduction and ensure that you both understand each other's agenda. So introduce yourself clearly, make sure that you are talking to the correct patients to check that uh, you've got the right name. Let them know that what you will uh, be discussing with them will remain confidential. There can be um, a lot to get through. So it's important to be mindful of structuring the consultation so that you're able to stick to the time frame. Uh, on the one hand, you need, you're going to have to ask open-ended questions, so particularly useful at the beginning of the consultation, but you also need to focus on specific points, so you may have to uh, ask specific questions to try and make sure that you get your agenda sorted out and what you need to know. Um, and in this, in, in this regard, it's important um, to show that you are actively listening, watching for cues, addressing the patient's concerns, and perhaps even uncovering a hidden agenda. Watch their body language. Do they look uncomfortable? Do they look as though they want to tell you something? Um, you can go back to them and say, I can see that you're uncomfortable. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell me? Is there anything else that I haven't asked which you want to discuss at this consultation? So it's these kind of questions which are really quite helpful to try and get more information out of the patient. Make sure that you check with the patient that they understand you and ask if you need to go over um, anything again. Um, and at the end, it's important to summarize. I can't um, uh, uh, emphasize the importance of summarizing. You really don't want to run out of time because the summary is actually quite important because it summarizes your findings. This is to the patient, by the way, not to the examiner. So you summarize your findings to the patient, come up with a conclusion uh, in, a, in a kind of non-jargon way so the patient understands. Um, you may end up having to give a differential diagnosis and, and just be honest, you know, listen, um, it was really lovely having a chat with you and having this consultation. I'm still not quite clear what's going on, but I think it could be one, two or three. And as a result, um, this is the management plan moving forward. And you may want to give them appropriate investigations and say, I think you need three investigations, firstly, secondly, thirdly, and then go through them and then try and give them a time scale and also a safety net so that they can get in touch with you in the interim during these investigations um, if there are any problems. Um, in terms of um, the mark scheme, um, the Royal College, uh, I'm sure you may have come across this already, but there are various clinical skills and um, uh, there are descriptors which um, they, they talk about uh, going from A to G. Um, 
with regard to the history station, um, right, you, you can get rid of A and B, which are more examinations. So you've got C, D, E, F, G. So this is clinical communication, as you might expect. So with the history station, um, you need to elicit a, a clinical history uh, relevant to the patient's uh, complaints. You need to be systematic, fluent, always be professional, um, explain the clinical information accurately, and try and be as structured as you can. So if you're not, you know, also signpost the patient. So uh, I would like to discuss this now and then go through it. And then if, you, if you're not sure, then clarify again. So let me understand you correctly. So you've told me this, this, and this. So you can always, you know, double check on a patient in case you're not quite sure. But again, just be mindful of the time that you have. These for differential diagnosis. So obviously you need to come up with a, a sensible differential diagnosis. E is clinical judgments. So the examiners will want you to have a sensible and appropriate management plan along with treatments um, and then apply the clinical knowledge uh, as, as needed. You do need to address the patient's concerns and the remarks for this as well. Um, as I say, the patients may have a particular agenda or the relative may have an agenda. So it's important to listen uh, to the patient or relative, pick up on the cues that they have. Um, and then you can also repeat again back what they've said just to make sure that you're on the same um, on, on the same line. Confirm their understanding, demonstrate empathy. And, and Gautam will go through a bit more on empathy and sympathy uh, and the semantics behind that. Uh, and then also, also throughout, to be honest, the whole of PACES, we need to look at patient welfare. So you need to treat the patient or the relative respect, uh, respectfully and sensitively. And that's in all the stations. So if you're uncovering a patient in an examination, make sure you cover them up at the end. Uh, if you're looking at their hands, don't grab them. Ask them if they've got any pain. Ask them to move their hands back and forth rather than you grabbing them and, and moving them. But similarly, during the communication uh, stations, make sure that they're comfortable. Uh, make sure that, they're, that you, you're showing dignity. Make sure you're listening. So that's really, really important. Um, why don't we stop there? Gautam, do you want to come in at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I might just, just keep the, the, just go to the previous slide, Robin. I think uh, I'll fill in a yeah. few things. So my next bit moves on to station four. Yeah. If you can just go back to the previous slide before the history one, then we'll do the, yes. Which one? So fundamentally, I mean, talking from the overseas perspective, I was an overseas candidate myself. I worked in UK now for more than 18 years, but I had to go through this grill, what you're going to, attempt. Uh, fundamentally, our basic skill there, what we practice, the way we practice medicine is very difficult or different the way we practice in the UK. And here, uh, as Robin has alluded to just now, listening is the key. Listening. You are not running the conversation. The patient should be the focus at all the time and you are allowed uh, to put in your input now and again. Now, what we are trying to evaluate here when you're assessing in a patient skill is essentially majority of UK graduates will take this exam during their second year of internal medicine training. And what we are looking for is the ability to be as a first year registrar subsequently, uh, that these patients uh, can be looked after by our registrars independently in a clinic. Of course, there will be supervision adjoining. So your ability is essentially judged here, how to run an independent conversation in a clinic setup with a patient of course, you have your consultant next door, but, but you will be judged in that 14 minute period that whether you can extract the right information for the patient, you can assimilate the information for the patient, then you come with a cohesive and comprehensive plan and you give that plan to the patient, taking into account that every step, what the patient wants of you. So you are not going to impose on the patient. Of course, your clinical knowledge will come into practice after you have listened to the patient and give them a whole list of differential diagnosis, management plan, summary of what you have discussed, and of course, ongoing follow-up, safety net advice, everything. But then the patient should be given an opportunity at every time to speak and say that when you wind up, that do you have any other questions at any point? Is there anything that you want to know? Is there anything I have not covered over there? Anything that has been missed? So you have to give that autonomy. So that is the focus where we say that autonomy has to be given. And that is very much mentioned on the patients uh, in, in the RCT website, that at every time you are going to act in the interest of the patient and you respect the patient's autonomy. So you're not going to jumpstart and, and just uh, say, uh, it's, it, it cannot be a unilateral discussion what happens in our clinical setup uh, in different parts of the world. So here it is a very bi-directional, but the patient is in charge. 
and at every point when you interact with the patient, I think your truthfulness, your honesty, and of course, if you have made a mistake or something that you don't know, you have every right to acknowledge and accept that. As Robin has just said, that if you don't know the answer, you do not say something that is untrue. You can very well say, I will discuss with my senior, I will discuss with my consultant and come back to you with a more constructive, comprehensive plan. And the patient will be more than happy with that. They are much more reassured without you doing something wrong, but rather going in a structured way, discussing with your boss. And you can always pick up the phone later and say, yeah, I'll give you a ring once I have managed to discuss with your boss. And at every point, whatever you're discussing, the benefits and the harms has to be uh, discussed with the patient as well. Now, from our perspective, even in the history, before you start, I think that professional demeanor, as Robin has said, the eye contact, the upright posture, those things has to be there. We have an inherent tendency when you come here is to say too many sorry, please, and thank you. That shouldn't be there. You will use your pleases, you will use your sorries and thank yous, but you don't overdo it, okay, at any point of time, but because that is very eye-catching and then it is, it is actually acting, but you are not acting there. You are in a very real clinical scenario. Of course, the person who is in front of you is not a real patient, but they are trained to enact as a patient, but you don't go into an overdrive of acting. And that permission is very important. Everything that is needed in that room has to be taken permission from the patient, that what the patient is comfortable with. And that is, that is what you have to replicate because what you are trying to replicate here is a clinical scenario in a 20 minute frame. And that is exactly how clinics are conducted here. You get 20 minutes, you get a, for a new patient, you get around 20, 25 minutes. And for a follow-up patient, you get around 15 minutes. So in that span of time, the two examiners who are in the room are judging your ability to take the information, do the relevant examination, assess the patient, give a comprehensive plan, and then uh, explain or explore all the possible concerns the patient have. And that is what is being judged here. Robin. Yeah, so I, I, I completely agree. And I, I, I think one of the other um, elements is to try and really think about the words that you are using. And you may end up having to try and learn particular phrases, um, but it's, all, it's also practicing this all the time. So if, you, if you're in the UK and you've got um, English speaking patients, it's actually quite easy because you can practice it on a, on a day to day basis. If you're not and um, you're speaking with um, patients uh, whose first language isn't English, it's actually much more difficult. And then you need to have some form of structure um, to be able to practice it. And, you know, in part, it will be um, courses like, like this, but also you need to be able to have a group of um, friends that are doing paces together where you can actually practice this on a, on a weekly basis. Otherwise, um, you know, when you go into the real thing, it's going to be really quite, quite tough. And from the what? history perspective, I think, Robin, uh, yeah. the, the structure, as we emphasize, at no point of time, you can flip-flop between the structure. So whatever you've learned from medical school, you're presenting complaint, background information, medication history, personal history, that structure has to be thoroughly maintained in that history tech because that is exactly how it is being marked. Uh, you're exploring the lifestyle of the patient, the social and personal circumstances, occupational history, family history, travel history if that is relevant. So that structure cannot be, you cannot flip flop between the structure because that is not augering well with your level of seniority. They're trying to judge whether you follow that pattern throughout. And then you can, after that, come to a, a, a list of one or two and two, three possible or plausible diagnosis, either of the, and then how you execute that information in, in, a, in a paragraph to the examiner, because that is what is going to be asked. What are your, uh, what, what is your assumption from these uh, conversations? So that don't lose that framework of the history taking that you have been historically doing over and over again. And as Robin has said, the practice should be purely in English in a group of three and not more than four. So one should be a patient, one should be the, the candidate, and one is there to assess. So don't make it more than three to four people because it will be a crowd otherwise. It doesn't help. I have done it myself and it, it doesn't help. Three to four people in a room judging with clear uh, proper clinical sessions and exclusively the conversation. It, you will find if, if you don't interact with UK patients on a day-to-day -day basis, people who are from overseas, it is very difficult for you guys there to hold a conversation in English language for a period of 15 to 20 minutes. So 15 minutes with the patient and then five minutes with the, uh, with the examiner. And you will find it very difficult until and unless you practice this day in and day out. So every 
uh, possible or plausible scenarios has to be practiced day in and day out in English language, in English language. Otherwise, you will find it very difficult because that sleekness is not going to come. That is what they're trying to see. The sleekness of your delivery of a language that is completely not your first language. That That is easily visible there. Okay, so please my, my, be mindful about that. Robin. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so that, that's a brief overview of station two. So that's the history station. And I, I completely agree. Um, you may feel like you're going back to being a medical student when you're going through that structured history. But having that structure is actually really quite helpful um, because when you go into um, the exam, um, most people, the majority of people are actually quite nervous. And having that structure, which you've done you know, throughout your medical career is really, really, really quite helpful. But it's also helped from, from the examiner's point of view, because if you go through that structure, they will recognize it as well, and they'll be able to make sure that you haven't missed out any, any bits. Uh, whereas if you do it in a haphazard way, but still cover um, all the information, um, the examiners may not necessarily pick up on that all the time. And then you may end up having, you know, fewer marks, even though you haven't uh, missed out anything. So yeah, structure, structure, structure is really important. Yeah, because that, that structure is in the marking sheet. I've got it, the, got the points here. If you see the marking sheet for history taking, then, then the first point how they mark or how we mark is uh, omit improve, uh, uh, information unsystematic. So if you're not systematic, they will mark you negative. And then it says appears unpracticed. So that is again an unsatisfactory history marking and unprofessional. So if you if you lose that framework of the history taking, you will be marked negative or unsat unsatisfactory there. And then you are not going to be able to come to a list of possible diagnoses. Again, you're marked how you are delivering it to the examiner. It says gives inaccurate information, uses jargon, and it is poorly structured. So it is very, very relevant that that systematic structure in where you take the history from the patient and how you convey it to the examiner, it is, it is, it is properly marked. It's very objective, the markings. If you don't do it, you don't get it. It's as simple as that. Yeah, Robin. Okay. Um, we, we can come back to the history taking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, any, absolutely. We'll come back. Any questions? Um, let me see if I can. Okay, so I was going to briefly also talk about um, station four. Uh, which, as you know, is the communication skills um, and the ethics um, station. Um, this is quite different um, to station two, but you'll still need to use um, the same communication skills that you would have in, in station uh, two, but also all the, all the other stations, to be honest. I, I've already mentioned um, how poor communication can lead to not only patient dissatisfaction, but also poor compliance from patients with untreated illnesses. They don't take the tablets if they don't trust their doctor, uh, but it can also lead to increased complaints. And this is partly why we have these exams to try and make sure that you've, you've set a, a particular bar, that you have a, um, a particular um, level of understanding and communication uh, with your patients. Um, similarly, you'll be expected to structure the consultation with the patient or a relative, um, explain clinical information, and then apply your clinical knowledge to the context that's given. That's the slight difference, I think, between station four and station two. So it may involve um, applying specific knowledge of ethics, and there may be some elements of negotiation or maybe even conflict resolution to try and ensure that your agenda and the patient's agenda align with each other by the end of the consultation. You may need to provide uh, emotional support. So if you're breaking bad news, for instance, uh, but deal with other emotions as well, such as a relative who is angry. Um, breaking bad news is actually very difficult, I think, um, for a lot of um, candidates. Um, generally, uh, and it's, uh, it must be a gender difference, but girls tend to do better um, than boys. And so if you're male, you need to probably, you know, show, it's, it's showing that empathy uh, to the patient, which girls tend to do a lot better. So if, if you feel as though you're not good at, for instance, breaking bad news, you need to practice that more so than something else. There's also the angry patient, which is also very difficult um, to deal with. Uh, if you have a patient that's uh, uh, walking around the consultation room uh, and you don't know what to do, you need to try and be able to calm them down, get them to sit down so that you can start the consultation um, properly. And that could be with a relative, doesn't have to be with a patient. Uh, and always make sure that you're looking at that dignity and that respect. 
and make sure that you're actively listening uh, to the patient. What are their concerns? Ensure that you acknowledge those concerns. And that could simply be by um, repeating what they say. Uh, there are some of the things that we'll practice in, in the communication course uh, that we do. Um, so uh, to an angry patient, for example, you may say, I can see that you are angry and I can understand why you feel like this, but please let me explain the situation. Why don't you just take a seat and then we can go through this? We're not getting anywhere. You know, and, and this, these are the kind of things that you need to learn to learn to say. And this shows that you're acknowledging that the patient is angry and that you're listening to them, but you're also showing empathy and um, you are uh, looking to resolve um, this particular uh, conflict. Um, similar to um, station two, uh, it's the same um, kind of scenario. So you get five minutes to go through the um, scenario. Um, it's really important to use these effectively. So, you know, if you need to make notes, try and structure it. So, you know, uh, into maybe um, beginning, middle and end. So at the beginning, you're going to introduce yourself and, you know, you're going to try and find out what, what's going on. In the middle bit, you're going to try and find out these things. And at the end, you need to make sure that you summarize these particular things. So try and structure it in those five minutes so it makes sense to you. And then as usually you get 14 minutes for the um, for the history with the patient of the consultation, one minute for reflection, and then five minutes of discussion with the two examiners who will be observing you throughout uh, the consultation. So here are um, a few of the potential scenarios that you may come across in station four. This is not exhaustive. Um, as you can see, there's a huge variation from uh, managing patient autonomy to breaking bad news, which I've mentioned. This is a, this is a really a difficult one. Uh, to deal with angry patients, perhaps dealing with a complaint, something that's gone wrong. Um, you may need to form, uh, perform a capacity assessment. The consultation may deal with um, confidentiality um, or duty of candor uh, for negligence. Um, th these come all, all the time in day-to-day -day practice. And one of my trainees um, had an issue with duty of candor. And she came to me a couple of weeks ago, we've still been dealing with it over the last couple of weeks. So there's a reason why these um, come up in MRCP. It's because we have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as you, you know, as you're a doctor. So duty of candor, really quite important. Some of you may even know, 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 uh, not know what it is, um, but this is very, very important. Uh, there may be counseling, uh, genetic conditions, for instance, Huntington's career seems to come up a reasonable amount. Uh, or quite difficult um, decisions regarding withholding or withdrawing um, life prolonging treatments. Um, these can be very difficult decisions normally, um, and you need to be able to practice them. These are quite difficult to practice um, in, in uh, normal clinical scenarios. So as Gautam said, if you have a couple of friends, then try and, and, and practice those in English to make sure uh, that you can, you can deal with it. And, uh, often try and have a, a you know if you've got a, a friend who's doing it try and make sure that they're they're being a bit difficult try and push you uh, as hard as you can uh, with a relative for instance who strongly disagrees with the treatment plan that you are um, suggesting and this may go on to the need for discussing um, organ donation advanced directives uh, there's also um, fitness to drive um, to the DVLA guidelines so if you're practicing for those of you who are in the UK at the moment uh, this hopefully will be quite easy because it's something that you have to deal with um, sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis. If someone comes in with an MI or they've had a PCI or they've uh, got heart failure or they've had a fit, you need to be able to understand um, when they can next drive and you need to give them the advice that they can't drive. You need to understand between group one and group two licenses whereby someone may drive a normal car or they may be a bus driver or a lorry driver and that's their earnings. If they don't do that and they're self-employed, they get no money. And so they are very angry and they want to be able to drive. So you need to be able to convince them and tell them what the law is as well. Uh, what's in their health interests, what's in the health interests of other people uh, around them. Um, so you need to read up on these if you're not practicing um, in, in the UK. Now, I've shown you this already, but there's, uh, so D is taken out. Um, so in terms of the skills that you need to do for station four, it's C, E, F, and G. Um, so it's the similar things that we've discussed already. 
So it's, um, I'd say, listing the history, getting the information that you want to be. You need to be systematic, try to be thorough and fluent, always be professional uh, and try and uh, explain the clinical information accurately. Don't use jargon as much as you can. And therefore, it should hopefully be in a clear and structured manner. Um, you always have to try and have a, a management plan uh, in this in this case that you need to don't necessarily try and put that straight away. So try and get all the information to start off with. But then when you co come up with your management plan, you need to be able to explain that to the patients appropriately. There may be investigations or treatments uh, that are applicable, but all of these different scenarios have, have different outcomes, which you need to be very mindful um, of. Uh, and particularly with station four, you may need to know a little bit of law or ethics. Um, and as before, you always have to address the patient's or the relative's concerns. Make sure that you're actively listening to the patient. If you're not sure, then, you know, as I say, touch base with them again. So from what you tell me, I understand that you think this, this, and this. Is that correct? And if you're not, then they'll say, no, no, that's completely wrong. This is what I think. So asking them questions like that is actually quite useful. Or halfway through, now that we've discussed this, let me just summarize what I, I think and then go through it. Uh, at the same time, obviously, be mindful of the time that you have, the 14 minutes. Um, there, there are, you need to also understand what kind of person you are. There are some people who will finish, and I mean finish, within eight minutes. And if you finish at eight minutes, the examiners generally will not say anything. Um, sometimes they're allowed to give one prompt. So they'll say, would you like to discuss this? Sometimes they won't say anything. And then there'll be silence for the next six minutes, which is actually quite... Difficult. Very uncomfortable, that silence. Very, very uncomfortable. You finish. Practice. You need to practice, 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 and understand what those 14 minutes are. Yeah, that's really, really quite important. And if you run out after 10 minutes, then you need to use the techniques like, okay, let me summarize again what I've said. Uh, I think you are doing this, this, and this. Is that correct? Is there anything that I've missed? Is there anything that you want to tell me? that's important. So those kind of questions are really quite um, helpful because not only can you spread the time to the 14 minutes and not have the silence, but also if you've missed something out, then the patient as well will have prompts to tell you certain things. And so you can prolong the consultation, but you also may get more information. And then that helps you again to, to summarize, do the investigations to the patients um, at the end of the end of the consultation. And we've already discussed this. Um, so, you know, obviously be respectful, be sensitive, um, and then treat the patient with, with dignity. So similar to station two, but just a slight, slight change in terms of it. There may be a bit of ethics, a bit of law. Um, uh, it may be dealing with a particular um, issue. So an angry patient, breaking bad news, um, and breaking bad news, we can't really discuss it in, in this time frame. That, has to, be, that has to be done in the station. Yeah, using Robin, can I just come in? Yeah, yeah I finished. I finished. I, no, I no, no, that's okay. You, you just keep this one in, in the, this, this slide here. So okay. as Robin has said, I mean, uh, practice of medicine in UK is very evidence-based. So your eminence doesn't carry any value. Who are you? It doesn't matter. You are just a individual serving a patient in a clinic. So don't be judgmental in that scenario that what your patient knows or doesn't know because she is there or he's there to seek help. Uh, so at every point you have to pitch the conversation. Of course, you'll follow that structure, but you have to make appropriate assumption about the knowledge and understanding of the patient. Like that, then that those <coughs> medical jargons can, cannot come at any point. It has to be a very simplistic English language. And if you can see the marking here, this is how exactly how the thing is marked, your clinical communication, what is the patient's concern where you have addressed it, your clinical judgment, and maintaining patient's welfare. I think that is paramount. If you see Royal College website, they have said candidates should respect, they should have the sensitivity for the patient, they should comfort the patient at every time. So if your patient started to cry and wail, there is every reason you can offer them a tissue. That's fine. You can take a pause. Then you should ask, are you okay? Should I continue the conversation? So again, that permission is important because you cannot just continue in somebody who has just bowed their head and maybe grabbing the thoughts after you have broken a bad news. So you have to give that pause and that poise to the patient. The patient has to regather and you have to, you have to ask the patient, uh, would you mind if I continue? Are you happy for me to continue? And then checking the safety of the patient, like what Robin has said, if, we are, if you are disclosing a very bad diagnosis, a cancer diagnosis, or somebody's dad has just died and you are 
discussing that diagnosis, whether you have ensured the safety of that person or the relative, that what is the impact of that news now? You, you can always ask questions. Are you sure you want to leave the clinic now? Do you want a nurse by your side? Uh, uh, how are you going to get home? So these questions are very relevant because this is what we do in the clinic. And of course, upholding the dignity of, uh, you can't trample the patient at any time. That this is, this is a CT scan, I found a intracerebral hemorrhage, this is your father, your father's going to die. So if you, if you convey it like this, you're never going to pass paces, never, never. So that, that empathy, which, 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 was, which I think I want to stress today, that uh, we, we, we make a mistake about what is being sympathetic and what is being empathic. And, and if you, Robin, if you just take to the previous slide, please, the, the scenarios. Uh, this one? Yeah. So there will be a lot of scenarios here where you will have to exhibit your sympathetic or your, your empathy to the patient. But it is, it is the empathy, I think, that is more important. Sympathy is more of a feeling of a, a sense of sorry or pity or sorrow. But you don't need to get into their shoes. You have to understand and you, have to, you should be in a position to share the feelings. The patient should be emotionally connected to you. You don't need to hold their hands. You don't need to give your shoulder for them to cry uh, upon your shoulder. Those things are not needed because it is clearly mentioned there. You're not going to touch the patient, you're not going to examine the patient. But the patient should entrust you that emotional connect or the bond or the rapport, as, as Robert has been saying repeatedly, has to be established within a minute or two. Otherwise, they are not going to unfold as you would require. Then you would be requiring to ask a lot of leading questions. And that completely jeopardizes that structure. So that, that, that rapport is important, that, that sense of empathy, because it, it, it shows your compassion for the patient and you can be mutually beneficial to each other. That means the patient will take the comfort from you and you can extract the relevant information from the patient. And when you try to wind up, I think you have to follow that structure as well, as we have mentioned, even in the history section, that you, you summarize, you explain, and then again, if there is a plan to be given, you give them, if there's a follow-up that is needed, but uh, the patient also understand you are a junior doctor, you're not expected to know everything. So there is every reason to believe that you have an opportunity to come back. I will consult, I will write back to you. I will consult my boss, I'll give you a call again. So you don't need to know everything and convey in, in that 15 minute setup to the patient. You can always come back, you can always come back. And uh, of course, ensure their safety, give them support. Do you want a nurse by your side uh, or any, any such or something very similar? And then at the end of the, at the conversation, give them the opportunity to speak again, any concerns, any questions that you have. So these are methods that has to be followed and that will speak volumes. That means that because they carry marks in that objective uh, section that when the examiners give the marking. So please follow that structure. Uh, I don't think, yeah. And don't overdo, don't overdo please at any point of time. Yeah, Robin, I think. That is okay yeah, I was gonna. I, I picked up one of your points about um, in, uh, kind of going into the introduction. Um, yeah. I, I've done lots of examining, and often within the first half a minute to a minute, probably earlier, I know exactly whether the, the candidate's going to pass or fail. So the introduction is just so important. It's how you, you portray yourself, how you communicate. Um, and even if you know all the stuff, it's the way you say it that's so important. So try, you have to practice, practice, practice. Yeah, and that, that professional demeanor can be judged within one to two minutes. And let me tell you in, in real terms, for overseas candidates, your performance has to be 200% rather than 100%. Until and unless you have done your medicine here uh, for a reasonable period of time. That, that, uh, that method, that sleekness, that, that will only come through practice. You have to practice immensely at least for a minimum period of two to three months in a group of three to four before you undertake paces. Because every it is not only station two and four, which we are discussing today, but even station, when, you, when you're conveying it to an examiner in, in, in the respiratory, you have to, or a neuro or a cardio. And of course, station five has changed now. That involves consultation as well. So how you're conveying uh, in, 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 in a structured fashion in a way that we expect juniors to do here, is it has to be replicated there. And that will be needing practice guidance as well. So you can't just randomly turn up for patient's exam. You'll never pass that way. Okay. Have you got Dr. anything Robin, Robin uh, to say? Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Robin, Robin, open it to questions because I think we've, we've spoken quite a lot yeah, now. We, we, can, we can spend yeah. the next 15, 20 minutes on questions and then we can wind yes, up. Yes, there are a few questions in the chat box if you can just check. Now, have anybody got questions for us? You can just unmute yourself and ask 
Yeah, that may be easier. I, I can't now, see the chat box. You can't. I can see. Should I read it? Yeah, go on. So question one, I will take my case as exam in November. Tell how did you prepare station two, four, and five? Do you always need a study partner for the station recommended? Tell me books for these and videos. So this is a very vague question. My <laughs> answer to you, I, I'll take, I think we have already answered this question. We've answered it. Yeah. Station two, four, and five is extensive talking. Too much of talking there. So you will definitely need practice at least for three months or even more. Uh, in, in English language with like-minded partners, but don't overdo the group. It cannot be more than three, four people. And you are not going to learn it exclusively from YouTube videos or reading books. This has to be just talking, talking, and talking, because that is what you expect to do in the station. So Robin, you can answer the next one if you want. I was, I was just gonna say that you also need guidance. So it, it's all yes. fair and good uh, being in a group of three and practicing. But you need external guidance from someone who understands what's going on. And that's where courses are, are quite helpful. Yeah, somebody who can they tell can... you what, what, are, what are you doing wrong and how it exactly. can be Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was just learning certain phrases. It, it, to be honest, it's really not that difficult to learn. But it's I, I've, I've kind of dropped a few in at, um, dur during this time here. But just learning those and being able to reproduce those, um, you know, like stopping the patient and say, um, let me just stop you there let me just go back you know it's, it's those kind of things that are, are quite useful but it also makes you um uh, a more appealing doctor you're not just saying okay what's what's this what's that what's that uh, you need to make it a conversation so just imagine yeah. that person is a relative of yours or um is a real patient always think it is what what would a real patient want to hear this is not don't think it was an examination even though it is but try and make it flow that's really, really important. But even if we interrupt, that has to be very skillful because otherwise uh, the patient may just consume your time if you just allow them to speak going on and going on. So you have to be very mindful how you do it. That, that's the tactfulness you have to learn. Okay, Robin, you can answer this, the second question. I can, I can read from here. Can you please tell me how many days back before the exam I should attend a course for faces? Robin. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. I think you need to know when your when your date of the exam is. Um, I think before you attend a course, it's well worth trying to do as much reading as you can. So for the history perspective, um, hopefully, to be honest, you will you you should know all of this already. Um, but um, from the ethics side, I, I mentioned a few things like DBLA. I think it's useful to read some books on how to break bad news techniques. Um, also, also things particular to the UK like duty of candor. So if you learn a few of those before you come to a course, that's good. I wouldn't do a course just before your paces, ideally. So try and do it after you've read some basic information, because then you go to the course, what you'll find during, the, um, and I've done this for many years now, is that when you start uh, the very first um, consultation, you'll be really bad. And then throughout the day, you'll gradually improve and improve and improve. You listen to other people and then you get better and better. And by the end of the day, um, you'll, you'll be a completely different person to how you were at the beginning. Um, that, that's for taken. And then you can go back and then try and work with those techniques in a group of, let's say, um, three people. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you did badly, you probably need to take another communication course, another refresher just before your actual pace of the exam. So I wouldn't do it, it's, it's not an easy question to answer, but I wouldn't do it too early and I wouldn't do it too late. So try and get some information and knowledge to start off with so that you perform reasonably well at the course and then put that into practice over a number of months, ideally, before you take the actual exam. Yeah, I think that, that is correct. I think you need an evaluation course at the end if you find one, but you need a proper course which takes you through all this uh, nitty gritties of the, of, the, of the stations really and then once you're prepared for two to three months, you can then take a exclusive evaluation course, uh, which is offered in multiple sites at the moment. Uh, I was going to say that yes. courses that go through book work are not really very good. You need to go to courses that um, get you to communicate with other with, with a patient or a surrogate and where you listen to other candidates um, going through histories. And you can spot what's right, what's not right, and you learn from that. But also, you need to ensure that you're having an opportunity to take a history or do an ethics scenario 
the courses where they just go through this is the DVLA guidelines are useless because you can just do that at no, home no, no, no. and you're wasting time you're wasting money so always go to courses which give you that clinical that clinical feedback those courses should have a UK connection. People, people, this is a UK exam at the end of the day. It is designed for UK graduates. So it has to be somebody who knows the UK system very well, and he will tell you the wrong rights and wrongs that you're doing in that station. Otherwise, that, that, that is the whole purpose of a course. Uh, so that has to be a proper course. It cannot be just, just a random course where, where they just take you through the MRCP website, give you a few scenarios, and then, then you start discussing with yourself. No, it can't. So there is a question here again. As an international medical student, do we need to work in U one to two years in UK before appearing places? No, no. Uh, no. You, should, you should know that there's that already, to be honest. But you, you know, you. I know there's a lot of international India, centers these days. But you can you can work in India and you can take places in, in India. Yeah. There are, there are places but, but the standards are the same. I mean, if I if I can remember when I was conducting exam, the standards are same that uh, the pass rates go, do not go beyond thirty percent. So. In 10, 10 candidates, I think three or four will pass. So you have to be, has that statistics changed, Robin? Do you know? I, I did think it was higher actually, but Barto's on the line, so he may be able to give you an exact. Uh, has, it, has it changed now? Because uh, it, it cannot be more than four people because that is how RCP has maintained the standards in terms of, uh, there will be always one or two rubbish candidates, three or two or three will be borderline. And then at I, the I end of the day, People yeah. at our hospital, I think it depends as well where you come from. So where you do, yeah, absolutely, hospital, where you do. Yeah. Uh, we have a pass rate of 90%. Um, and all the all of my junior doctors have passed for the last five years. That's, that's so an exception because they all work where, in UK, where you're yeah. coming from as well. That, that's the other issue. No, no I'm and, saying about the overseas type. The UK pass rate is definitely higher. Yeah, definitely higher because they work here. This is what they have to replicate in an exam scenario. Uh, so the pass rate here will be higher. But peripherally, I think Pastor is there. He can fill in us about his uh, Maybe uh, the pass rate rates. Uh, outside, yeah. Okay, there is one more question here. Uh, what resource do we use for the ethics station? Robin, can you hear me? Yeah, what yeah. resources for the ethics station? Yeah, for the ethics station. So there are there are... Yeah, so I mean, there are lots of books out there. So yeah, there I think, a lot of books. Um, yes, ha have a look and see what what books. Um, try and get something up to date, which is always useful. And then, as I say, read through the various things in terms of breaking breaking bad news is a difficult one. So try and obviously focus on that. Um, angry patients. There are lots of little concepts like um, capacity and you know the four stage capacity assessment. Making sure you understand that making sure you understand confidentiality, duty of candor. So it's, it's to try and get those concepts. And there are lots of books out there. Just try and get the, the latest one, to be honest. They're all similar and they all say the same thing. Um, organ donation, DVLA guidelines, you get that from the DVLA website. Um, so it's just looking through all of that and just, um, yeah, just going over it again and again. So it becomes part and parcel of what you know. I think I, I, there are some UK students, um, doctors here, and you guys will um, be practicing this on a day-to-day -day basis, so it's easy for you. Um, and you'll be looking it up for patients that you're seeing on the ward. For those um, outside the UK, you need to read up on it, unfortunately, uh, rather than just revise what you hopefully are practicing all the time. Uh, but yeah, th there are lots oh, of- Oh, Ryder's book used to be very good. Ryder's book what? was still probably, is it still there? Is it still available? Ryder. Yeah. Uh, well, since you did it, there's a new edition out. But yeah, um, uh, you speak. Yeah, it's it's, it's very Ryder, good. Ryder was my boss in Birmingham. I worked under him, so I know him very well. Yeah, no, I knew <laughs> Ryder's I, book was uh, good, but there well, are plenty what, of scenarios. Yeah, on the on the yeah, MRCP what, website as well. What's quite and useful? Course, yeah. What's quite useful for Ryder's book is the snippets at the beginning. So when when you're doing the examination, it's presenting that patient appropriately. So I, I wouldn't say necessarily memorize, but it's very useful to have that um, overview of the patient with a particular condition. And then you take out all the positive things they don't have, put in negative things that they have, and then you say it. And, that, and that's one of the best ways. So you can, you can still fail a cardiovascular examination, for instance, if you don't present that patient properly. So it's all to do with, unfortunately, communication. Every, you know, we, we focus on station two and four, but communication is about station one, two, three, four, and five. So it's all of them. But yeah, Ry Ryder's book is good. There's another one by Balliger, which is good. There's a few new ones that have come out as well, which are smaller, um, which, are, which are fine as well. Uh, and there's lots of information on the internet as well, but it's what whatever 
takes your fancy, to be honest. Um, what I would suggest is pick pick one or well pick pick one or two, but don't pick um, seven eight different sources and read all of them. So you're just going to waste time. Just pick the best ones that you agree with that you like. Uh, try and make them as as recent as possible, and then just focus on those one or two sources and learn them well, rather than what some of the candidates do. And they they look at seven different sources and try and learn all of them. That that's not the best way to do it. So that's similar to uh, part one and part two, learning for the MCQs. Yeah. Okay, this is a question from Dr. Azaz Khan. So during a 14 minute consultation, at what point would you break bad news early on after three to four minutes? Well, there is no time scale like that. It's a, it's a station. It depends on what you're breaking actually. It could be anything. It could be you're speaking to a relative of a person whose father is brain dead, or you could be speaking to a person who just has a new hereditary or a, or a cancer diagnosis. So how you insinuate into the patient if you have established a rapport within the first one to two minutes, that's an individual skill. There is no time scale how you, at what point of time either, but the earlier you do in a very skillful way, the earlier is better. So you've got plenty amount of time uh, to comfort the patients, explore their empathy, dignity, whatever you want to, and then uh, also answer the relevant questions. So there is no time scale for any of the station because all the stations are very different. How you do it is the skill you develop over two to three months once you start to practice this individual stations. And in terms of resources, I think MRCP website has got a lot of, uh, lot of resources there as well. And then we plan to run a proper course on this platform. So we will have plenty of resources available for you in terms of individual scenarios uh, when we conduct it. And of course, there are plenty of resources in the market. So it's up to, there's a cafeteria choice. So you can make yourself useful in any of those that you are comfortable with. Uh, I think the next question is not relevant at the moment. After completion of MRCP, what kind of job you got? That is not relevant for this platform. Uh, if a patient gets angry at any point, then the question ends uh, at your statement. So I think what the question means is, if a patient gets angry at any point with one of your statements, how do you tackle it? Robin? Yeah, it's, it's kind of what I said. So um, yeah, I think I the think first thing is to understand that the patient is angry and make sure that they understand that you know that they are angry. So you can say, I can see that you're angry. And then, and then you kind of have to delve down into why they're angry and try and calm them down. And, and it's quite, you know, you can do it quite quickly. And I've come across a few stations where the patient's just wandered around the room continuously and angry and the, and the candidate hasn't been, and you, you get kind of um, frustrated. Flustered, yeah, yeah. Candidate will get very flustered there, including examiners. But the key thing is active listening. Make sure you're listening yeah. to them. Acknowledge that they're angry uh, and then say, you know, take a seat. Let's discuss this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me how I can help you. What are you yeah. angry about? What can I help you? Uh, and and, and by, by asking those questions, the, the person has to answer and then it just gradually calms them down. Exactly. This is a very common scenario in the ward as well when the patient wants to discharge against medical advice. Some alcoholic come and you want to retain the patient just for observations, cover the head injury, CT scan is okay, still scoring high on different parameters. They want to leave and that is where your skill comes in. As Robin has said, that why do you want to leave? I think that is the fundamental question and just to calm them down. And I think within two or three minutes, you can break the ice very easily. You cannot go into overdrive and say, sit down there, don't be very... Uh, yeah, mightily overpowering there. I think you should give the patient that time and the patient will come down because that is purely acting what he's doing there. If you use the right words, he will definitely, he's, he's bound to come down. Uh, and then you explore. I mean, why are you angry? How can you explain your concerns and what makes you, I mean, what's, what's the uncomfortable thing here? And they will come that, out with the, with the real thing. There. Yeah, and, and that may bring duty of candor back. Um, it's really important to apologize uh, and say yeah, sorry. Yeah and make sure you say that early don't be embarrassed to, you know if there's been a mistake then you have to admit it and say look i'm really really sorry this shouldn't have happened if this was my mother then i would be very angry as well so you're showing empathy and you're putting yourself into their position and saying that you'll be angry as well if you're in this position i can completely understand why you're angry if i was in this situation i would be angry as well but listen how can we move forward how can we improve this situation what can i do to help you so it's, it's kind of saying things like that which gradually calm the patient down and i was going to um, similar to what you were saying about when to break bad news um 
I, I completely agree. Sooner rather than later. Yeah. I, I yeah. came across one candidate who broke it maybe eight minutes into the consultation, and the patient just became so angry, saying, "I've been sitting here for eight minutes while my father has died, and you've told me eight minutes later." Yeah. So try and yeah. you know be practical about these things, but at the same time, it's really important to set the scenario. Try and establish some form of rapport. So you both introduce yourself to each other, but also try and find out what that person knows. You know, tell me what do you know, and then they will say um, what what they know. And based on that, you can usually then say, well, unfortunately, things have deteriorated. So bring them down. Um, you know, your your father's heart stopped. Bring them down. We then resuscitate the patient. Uh, resuscitate your father and then bring them down. So you're doing it in a stepwise manner rather than just saying. I'm very sorry your father's died. So it's bringing them down slowly, but trying to do it, you know, after bring after forming that um, uh, that relationship, which is very short, but it, you know, it's very doable as well. And with rare ex exception, I can reassure you, people here are quite understanding. If you are transparent and honest, and tell them exactly what has happened, what's been done, what can be possibly done, they invariably come on board very easily. Uh, there will be always a few uh, exceptions, but uh, that is your skill then to handle them. But majority, what you'll encounter in the clinical scenarios and the examination, I think if you if you handle them tactfully, they will be on board very soon. But please don't leave it too late, because then you are you're you are running out of time to explore all the options that should be discussed. Because the marking is very objective. If you don't do it, you don't get marked. There is no grace marks or anything here. It's very the objectivity of marking is is very very uh, structured here. So if you are not covering that those segments you're not going to get marked at all so please be mindful about how to use that time as well yeah robin i think we have come to the end of the questions there is there, is there anybody else who want to unmute themselves or ask any questions in person you can do so now that's a silence yeah i don't see anybody unmuted here fine i think we should wind it up then robin Okay. I mean, we have, we have, we have one hour. Yeah, well, thank you all for attending. We hope it's um, useful. Um, good luck um, in all your studies. And yeah, if you touch base with us again, we'll be very happy to help in any way uh, that we can. So yeah, good luck. Good luck uh, again. Thank yeah, you. thank you for me as well. I mean, it's, it's been, a, I don't see there were 60 people, but at least there were good 20 plus people. I hope we have been of some benefit to you in terms of giving you a flavor how things are done here. It is, it is a difficult exam for overseas people, but I think once we start to practice with the right-minded or like-minded people in a small group, not overdoing things, not overtly being courteous and, being, and uh, breaking that frame, uh, then I think it should be okay. The more you practice, but please do practice in your uh, in, in English language because that is what you're going to uh, exhibit here. Uh, and that is what you're going to get marked on. Uh, I think this, this uh, webinar was uh, held today with the aim that we will be running a full course on this very soon. So I think the academy will be taking care of it. So uh, if you think that things will be beneficial from here on, then once the course is available, please do enroll. And I think Robin, myself, and a few of us will be available on the course uh, to guide you and help you through uh, uh, to pass this uh, exam. So it is not a difficult exam. We find it difficult, uh, but the objective of marking is very transparent. Nobody makes you fail deliberately. Uh, if you do it correctly, uh, uh, I have passed. There are a lot of people who have passed, so you will pass it as well. So our best wishes for you.